wonderful speakers. You know, as, as Robert was speaking, uh, you know, I couldn't help reflect. I, I, during the pandemic, I did, a, a, I don't know, how many virtual conferences or how many interviews I did. And people said, what do you think needs to happen when we get out of this thing? I said, easy, we need a Eucharistic Renaissance. You know, the first person who taught that Jesus Christ was not present in the Eucharist was who? Who would you think? Everybody thinks Calvin, Luther. It was Ber Berengarius of Tours, a deacon. Uh, sad to say. He was the first person in the 12th century, so before the Protestant Reformation, to teach that Jesus was not present in the Eucharist. He got excommunicated, but the Pope schooled him. And he eventually came back to the faith and he had to sign an oath of fidelity. And if you read St. Pope Paul VI's document, Mysterium Fidei, paragraph 52, you will see that statement that he had to sign. It is beautiful Eucharistic theology 101. The reason I mention that, because that started several hundred years of Eucharistic Renaissance in the church. That is when Eucharistic processions became popular. That is when uh, adoration, the monstrance, monstrare in Latin means to show. That was the word they used when a woman was pregnant. Monstrare, monstrance, it means to show. That, a couple hundred years after, that is when St. Thomas Aquinas wrote three of the most beautiful Eucharistic hymns in the history of the church. O salutaris, tanta mergo, panis angelicus. People, I, some of you probably didn't know it was Thomas Aquinas. I mean, that brilliant guy who wrote the Summa Theologica? The head and the heart. Hmm? The head and the heart. That's what we need to reconnect today because there is serious disconnect between our faith and our everyday lived experience. Just ask young people, man, this is boring. Why do they say that? Because they don't know why they're here. They're here because you dragged them here. They have no idea what any of this has to do with their life every day out there. But in their heart of hearts, they want exactly what Jesus is giving them here, body, blood, so that's what they want. They want truth. The truth that sets them free to love. The truth that sets them free to be the person who God created them to be. I speak to young people all over the world. They tell me, all, I've been to 31 countries, they tell me it's the same thing over and over. Deacon, we want to hear the truth and we're not hearing it. I gave a talk just as I was on tour in New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, and Australia. I spoke to 2,000 youth at a youth rally in Papua New Guinea. And what impressed me, I gave three talks, but the Q&A session, those kids asked some deep, serious questions. Even the organizers were surprised at the depths of the questions because these kids are thinking. They're seeing what's going on in the culture. They're confused. They know, wait, th that can't be right. But they're not getting answers from us. They want to know how much God loves them, and they don't. They all should come here with Father John. They'll learn. But they don't know. And they feel hopeless. I gave a talk on the Mass, on the Mass, to 1,300 kids at a school in Parramatta, Australia. Charbel was going to talk tomorrow. He was there. I talked to two, so it was 600 middle schoolers and then 700 high school kids. At the end of both talks, Charbel could not find me. And I ain't, the size of me, and I'm black, I ain't hard to, I ain't hard to find. Those kids mobbed me. They were all over me, and Charbel was like, where did Harold go? Because those kids like, oh my goodness, we've never heard anybody talk about the faith like this before. Because they want to hear, 
why does the, 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 the Father John break off the host and drop it into the chalice? What does, what does that mean and what does that have to do with your life every day? When they start to learn why, they will never leave the faith. And that's why we're doing this tour. To help reconnect people deeply and intimately to the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, tomorrow we're going to hear from Charbel Raish. He's going to talk about his story, how Islam led me to Christ. It, I, it is powerful. Trust me when I tell you, you're not going to want to miss that presentation tomorrow. And then we're also going to do some Q&A. Um, uh, in Los Alamitos, when we did this last night, they didn't want to stop. Um, you know, it got to the time and, I, and oh, please, just one more question, please, just one more question. Why? I, I'm noticing as I travel around, again, 250,000 miles a year, that people have questions. And so I think it's important to have, we have speakers of this caliber here to really address, a lot of people have burdens on their hearts. My kids are away from the church. I, I, I don't know what God's will is for my life. I'm confused about all the stuff that's going on in the church. I, I, I mean, th there's so much that people have on their hearts. And this is an opportunity to get some answers. Maybe get some clarity. Maybe to put things in a proper perspective. Always keeping Jesus Christ at the heart and the center of everything that we do because that is the center of who we are, is Christ.